intercession is completely different than Old Testament intercession. And it's amazing how people don't know that. And because of it, people are begging God and saying, repent, turn from your fierce wrath. They're telling God to spare America. Don't pour out your judgment. They're pleading with God. And that is completely a slap in the face of Jesus. In the New Testament, let me just start with this. I'm not going to teach on it, maybe. (laughs) But let me just start with this over here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. It's talking about Jesus and how in verse chapter two, that you make prayers, supplications, intercession, giving of thanks for all men everywhere. Verse two, for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. This verse says there's only one God and there's only one mediator. Did you know that Moses was called a mediator in Galatians chapter three, that the law was given and ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. It called Moses a mediator. And so Moses, uh, what a mediator is, is a person who stands in between two parties that are at odds with each other and you try and reconcile and bring them back into harmony. Moses stood between God and man. And in Exodus chapter 32, he said, repent, O God of your fierce wrath and turn from this. A man told God to repent. And what's even more amazing is that it says, and I think verse 14, God repented. (laughs) Moses stood and said, turn from your fierce wrath. And then Abraham stood between God and man. And he says, God, if there were 50 righteous people in Sodom, would you still pour out your wrath? Even if there were 50. And he said, no, if I could find 50, I wouldn't do it. And he says, how about if there was 45? How about if there's 40? How about if there's 30? How about if there's 20? How about if there's 10? And he finally quit. But here's Abraham twisting God's arm and saying, you wouldn't do something like this. Man, the ungodly are going to hear of this. And and God repented and God responded because Abram was an intercessor, a mediator between God and man. And you will use things like that. And then they turn over to Numbers chapter 16 where God got so angry, he was going to kill all of the people. And Aaron ran and stood in between the people who had died from the plague. And he had an, in, uh, uh, um, what do you call it? A censer of incense, which symbolized prayer and intercession. And he stood between the people that had died under the wrath of God and the people that hadn't yet been affected. And when the plague came to that prayer and intercession, it stopped and it saved the other people. And people use these as examples of way that we're supposed to pray. And yet in the New Testament, there's only one intercessor. There's only one mediator, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And for you to pray the way that an Old Testament deal person did and say, Oh, God, don't pour out your wrath on America. Oh, God, spare it. Oh, God, turn from your wrath. It's just like a slap in the face of Jesus that you didn't do enough. I've got to add to it. The reason Abraham and Moses could intercede that way is because Jesus hadn't come and the war wasn't over and God's wrath was on people and they were a mediator. But now there's only one mediator. And for a person to pray the way that most New Testament intercessors pray, binding and begging God to pour, not pour out his wrath and have mercy, it's antichrist. It's against what Jesus has done. I nearly preached on that, (laughs) but you ought to get that teaching on prayer to find out, man, there's a difference in the new Testament. Jesus has already done everything and he still flows through people, but it's more like father, this person over here is not responding to you and you won't force yourself on people. You've got to have an invitation. So I just stand in the gap and say, in the name of Jesus, you already love them. And I just release this love towards them. You bind the devil and rebuke the devil and resist him and he flees. But you don't beg God to do things. I have people come to me all the time and say, I've been praying for my husband for 20 years and God hadn't answered my prayers. Would you please pray? And maybe God will answer your prayer. 
And I tell people, no, I won't pray like that. And I have people say all the time, well, you wouldn't pray for it. You're implying that it's up to God whether your husband gets saved. And if you'd just pray enough, and if you'd pray right, then God would make that person get saved. I said, that is wrong, 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 wrong. God has already done everything that he can do to get that person saved. He's already provided for him. He already loves them more than you love them. And you're implying that somehow or another, you aren't the prayer warrior you should be. And maybe God would answer my prayers, because, but he wouldn't answer yours. You're saying it's all God that's at fault. God's not the one that's keeping people from being saved. You don't have to plead with God to get people saved. He wants them saved more than you want them saved. That kind of prayer is useless. I just pulled the rug out from under so many of you. It's like, <laughs> like but I tell you what, let me, let me just present it to you this way. How's your prayers working? How's it begging and pleading God and asking God to do all these things working? not working very well for most people. So if it's not working, how come you fight so hard to defend something that's not working? You need to find a better way to pray. You need to find out what the New Testament, what Jesus has done and how a New Testament intercessor stands. You'd get better results. You ought to get that teaching on prayer. That would fit perfectly with what we've talked about. Let's turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Are you, you should be close. If you were over there in 1 Timothy chapter 2. But I've been talking about from Hebrews chapter 8 verse 13 that when God said that there was a new covenant, he made the old covenant old and now that which is old is ready to vanish away. We are under a new covenant. And then John 13, 34 said, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. So we got a new covenant and a new commandment. And when he said that there is a new commandment, he made the old commandments old and they're ready to vanish away. You are not supposed to be living your life by the Ten Commandments. And if you missed any of this, uh, that may sound like heresy. I've, I've said there's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. We just got something even better. This new commandment, and I've already dealt with that. Please get the CDs or the DVDs before you choke on what I just said. <laughs> but look here in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says in verse 5, Now the end of the commandment is charity, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. There's two ways you can look at this. The end of the commandment. You could say the goal or the ultimate of the commandment is charity, God's kind of love out of a pure heart and of faith unfeigned. You could also say that the end of the Old Testament commandments is this New Testament commandment that Jesus talked about in John chapter 13, verse 34, about loving other people as Christ has loved us. And it says in verse 6, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. In the King James, this is really terminology that we don't use today, but this is just saying some people have left preaching on the love and the goodness and the mercy of God, and they have turned aside unto vain jangling just means stuff that is useless. It's like fables. And again, I'm saying this in love. We've got some pastors here today, and I'm for the church, and I'm for churches that are preaching the true gospel. I am not anti-church, but I am anti-religion. And there is a tremendous amount of our churches today that aren't preaching the, real, the true word of God. And they have just turned aside unto useless talk. That's what vain jangling means. They're just preaching things. Many of you go to churches that you've gone there for years and you still don't know the new covenant. You don't understand the goodness, the love of God. You know, I have to refrain myself when I'm talking to people because they come to me and they start telling me about, and I just know that they, they wouldn't understand the things that are in the word of God. They just have no recollection of it. And yet they go to churches every week and don't know any of this stuff. And I just have to refrain myself from saying, forget it. It's not going to work. But I tell you, it's important that you hear the true word of God. And many of us are going to dead, dead churches. I heard about a guy that died in church one time. They called 911 and they took out half the congregation before they found the dead person. 
mean, it was dead. And so in verse seven, these people who just turned aside and they're preaching things other than the word of God, it says they desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Boy, that is a powerful statement. People who are preaching the law, you got to live holy. They don't understand what they're saying. They define holy as you got to go to church. You got to wear your hair a certain way. Your dress got to be a certain length. You can't wear jewelry. And they do all of this clothesline preaching where it's all about the way you dress and stuff like that. And, you know, they'll use a scripture about don't let it be the outward man, the plaiting of the hair, the wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. You can't put your hair up in an, in fancy ways. You can't wear gold and jewelry and all of these things. But if they were going to be honest, the rest of that verse says, or putting on of apparel. If you're going to say that you can't do those things, then you can't wear clothes either. That's out of first Peter chapter three. It's amazing how people just pick and choose and they just do this stuff about you got to be drab looking. I've actually known women before that had rosy cheeks, but instead of looking like you had rosy cheeks, they make you put on powder so that you look bland. Man. I say, if your barn needs painting, paint it. If it needs two coats, give it two coats. Amen. People who are preaching the law, they don't know what they're saying because if you were to, if you were to truly say, all right, you got to be holy before God can move in your life. Where do you draw the line? Well, they usually draw it around their denomination and say, you got to do this and this and this. But I mean, where do you stop? God doesn't grade on a curve. It's not like, you know, nobody's going to be perfect, but you got to be the best you can. No, you either got to be perfect or you need someone who was perfect, Jesus. And you put faith in him. When people are preaching the law that you got to be holy, they don't, they don't live perfect themselves. And yet they're preaching perfection. It's hypocritical. I've had people come to me before and, you know, criticize me and stuff. And I say, so are you perfect? Do you do everything right? Well, no, I'm not, but I do this and I'm better than this person. See, they immediately have to start comparing themselves with other people. The only way you're ever going to look holy is to compare yourself to me or to somebody else. But when you stack yourself up against Jesus, you're going to come up short every single time. And so people who are preaching that you got to be holy or God won't answer your prayer and won't move. They don't understand what they're saying. They're preaching. They're digging a hole. They're digging their own grave because they aren't perfect themselves and they will come under their own judgment, whosoever they be. That's what the scripture says. And so it says here that they desire to be teachers of the law and they don't understand neither they don't understand neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. There is a right use of the law. The law is good if you will use it for what it's intended for. What's bad is when you use the law for something it was never intended for. Here's what the law was intended for in verse 7. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and for the disobedient, for the ungodly and for... Uh, sinners for unholy and profane, for murderers or fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves 
with mankind, for man-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Paul is saying that there is a purpose of the law. Who's the law made for? An unrighteous man. Who's righteous? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 says he made him, God the Father made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Ephesians 4 24, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. If you have been born again, you are a righteous man or woman. And the law isn't made for you. The law is made for people that don't know God who are thinking that they somehow or another are better than this person over here and that they're going to get into heaven based on their own goodness. The law is given to show you your sin and to take away your self-deception that you could ever earn God's favor so that you would quit trusting in yourself and you'd say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the purpose of the law. And if you use the law to show somebody how sorry they are, then that's the right purpose before you get born again. But once you're born again, God doesn't want you to know how sorry you are. And he doesn't want you to be focused on all of your sin. The law isn't made for a righteous person. It's not made for a born again person. You know, I had a situation uh, in Houston, Texas. This has been 30 years, 40 years ago. And I was holding a meeting. There was two or 300 people and it was in a hotel um, room. So people in the hotel were walking by and there was a guy who walked by the back doors, listened for a little bit. And then he came in and uh, sat down and listened to me preach. And in the middle of my preaching, he just stood up and began to counter everything and yell at me. And I tried to answer his questions and the guy was incoherent. He wouldn't respond to what I was saying. So finally, I just took my authority and I said, I command you to sit down and shut up in the name of Jesus. And this guy just sat right down. And I went ahead and finished the service. And then after the service was over, I went and got him, brought him down front. And I was talking to him and I was telling him about the goodness of God. And I said, brother, God can set you free. He was high on something. I don't know if he was drunk or dope. I, I never, I don't know how to tell the difference. I never got into that stuff. So anyway, but I could just tell he was just not all there. He was something else. And I was telling him about the love of God and about how God loved him and how God could change him. And this guy just looked at me and he says, I am God. He says, I don't need God. My life's perfect. I don't need anything. And you know what? I don't know exactly where he was coming from, but I just know that where he was was wrong. And I knew that he didn't know God. So you know what? I switched from telling him about how much God loved him and how God could help him to I started taking the word of God like a sword. And I just beat this guy to a pulp. I said, you sorry thing. You think that you're God. And I just took scriptures and I beat him to a pulp and showed him his sin and showed him how ungodly he was. And someday he was going to stand before God and have to give an account for all of this stuff that he was saying. And within moments, I had this guy in tears just crying, oh God, have mercy on me. That's what the law is used for. It's for a person who thinks that they don't need God, that they're okay on their own. That's why God gave the law is to knock you flat of your face so that you would quit being self-righteous and saying that surely God owes it to me because man, I go to church and I pay my tithes and I do this and this and this. And now God's got to move in my life. For you self-righteous, non-born again people, that's what the law is given for, to take away your smugness and your self-righteousness. But once you get born again, the law has served its purpose. And the law, if you start using it, then you are like he's talking about right here. You aren't understanding what you say. The law was never given to bring you into relationship with God. The law can't change you. The law can't save you. Keeping the commandments and doing these things will never change your life. It won't give you the love of God. All the law will do is show you how sinful you were and how ungodly you are and how you need God. But it is impotent to provide the change. Only the gospel can do that. The gospel is the only power that can change a person's life. 
And the reason we have so much religion in this nation and it is so pervasive and it hasn't changed our nation is because it hasn't been the gospel. It's been the law. Just telling people how ungodly they are. And after a while, people get tired of being told how ungodly they are and they resent it and they're mad and they're preaching against religion, but they aren't against God. They may not know it, but God is good. Man, God is the best thing that ever happened to the world. And the Lord loves us. And if we were to preach the true gospel and tell people about the goodness of God, there's a place to tell people that, hey, you're going to hell. but it's not all of the time. And that's not the gospel. That's not the power of God. We've got to get to telling them about, even though you deserve to go to hell, man, Jesus took your place. Jesus suffered for you and God isn't mad at you. He's not even in a bad mood. God's not even ticked off. God's not upset. God loves you in spite of what you've done. You go to preaching the goodness of God, it's the power of God and it'll turn men towards the Lord. Look over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I just want to start taking some scriptures here. I know some of those things that I've just said are really, really radical, and some of you say, this just can't be so. How could you say things like this? I want to show you a number of scriptures in the New Testament that show you what the purpose of the Old Testament law was. It was not something God gave that was good and that was helpful and it's going to make you so much better and God wanted to help you with this law. The law was given to kill you and to condemn you. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 55, this is a familiar passage of scripture. It says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. What a radical statement. If people would think about this, maybe they'd change their opinion about trying to live under the law and conform to all of these things. The strength of sin is the law. Why would God give something that would strengthen sin? The law didn't strengthen you in your battle against sin. It strengthened sin in its battle against you. Why would God give something that strengthens sin? It's because sin had already beaten us, and yet we didn't know it. You know, the scripture says, uh, is it 1 Corinthians chapter 10? If it is, I can find this real quick. It's either 1 or 2 Corinthians 10. But it says um, that they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. That must be 2 Corinthians 10. But this is what people do. They constantly compare themselves. You know, uh, in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis, uh, Cain killed his brother Abel. And instead of God judging him, God put a mark on him and says, if anybody tries to punish Cain for what he's done, I'll avenge his death sevenfold. God gave mercy to the first murderer on the face of the earth. Now, after the law came, see, that was before the law, but after the law came, the first person who broke the law was a man who picked up sticks on the Sabbath day so that he could make a fire and cook something. And when he broke that commandment about doing work, uh, Moses put him in prison, put him, locked him up, shut him up until he could hear the voice of the Lord. And God said, stone him to death, show him no mercy. The first person who broke the law was a man who picked up sticks to make a fire and cook something. And they said, kill him. The first person who sinned after the fall of Adam and Eve was a man who killed his brother and God gave him mercy and protected him. Can you tell that there's a difference between when the law was in effect and when the grace and the mercy of God was in effect? God didn't approve of what Cain did, but he extended mercy to him and even protection towards him. But in that same chapter in Genesis chapter four, 
Cain's great, great, great grandson, Lamech, comes along and Lamech tells his two wives, he's the first person in history that ever had more than one wife, and he tells his two wives, if Cain is going to be avenged sevenfold, I'll be avenged seventyfold because he killed a man in self-defense. And so he compared himself and says, Cain got by with murder. I can get by with murder because mine was more justified than his. See, this is what people do. They compare themselves. And because somebody over here wasn't struck dead by lightning and God didn't bring some judgment on them, people begin to think, well, murder's not so bad. Cain killed a person. Lamech killed a person. Other people killed people. Lamech has two wives. I could have 10 wives. And after a while, they just get to comparing themselves. And, and you know, basically anything goes. Man, this is alive and well in our society. Did you know 50 years ago, homosexuality, they still had homosexuals, but nobody bragged about it. Nobody had a parade. They didn't have gay pride. I mean, it was something that was going on, but people were ashamed of it. Now they've compared themselves and you have a rock movie star and you have a rock star and you have a politician. And after a while, this person didn't die and everybody just, you know, everybody's comparing themselves. And because this happened, you know, and because this happens, well, then it's okay for me to do this. And now basically just about anything goes. They're still doing the same thing. How did God stop that? He gave the law that, you know, people were thinking, they were just leaning under their own understanding and thinking, I think it's okay. I don't, I don't believe there's anything wrong with this. God says, you think you're okay? You think that the way you're living is all right? You think that you can still have a relationship with me by rejecting every standard that I give? Let me show you what right and wrong is. And he says, thou shalt not. And he, he gave a command and all of a sudden people go, whoa. If this is what God demands, I'm in big trouble. But you know what it did? It actually strengthened sin. Now, this is something that you may have to think about just a second. But if, if you will think back, all of you understand this. You know, if you're trying, when you were a little kid, I remember trying to get people to do things, other kids, you know, to walk across a log across a creek and you knew they were going to slip and fall into the creek. And, and you'd sit there and say, you can't do it. You just can't do it. You're a sissy. Or in Texas, we'd say, I double dog dare you. And when you double dog dare somebody, you couldn't get out of that. But you know, basically you just tell somebody you can't do it. Thou shalt not do it. And there's something on the inside of every person that when somebody tells you, you can't do it, bless God, you'll do it to your own hurt. You'll do it knowing that you probably shouldn't do it, but you've been dared to do it. You've been told you can't do it, and you, just something rises up. It's this old carnal nature that nobody's going to tell me I can't do something. If you want to get a person to do something, just tell them you can't do it, and I'll, they'll hurt themselves trying to do it. <laughs> you know, I was in a race one time, a, a 6K race, and I had already turned in a personal best. I had pushed myself to where I was worn out, and I was a quarter of a mile from the finish line and I was just, I was just barely making it to the end. And a guy started to pass me just right at the end. And he, he tried to pass me. And when he did, I tried to keep up with him. I'm a competitor. My dad taught me that second place is first loser. And I have never come in second on purpose in my life. I'm not a bad loser, but, but I never have thrown a game. And so anyway, this guy started to pass me and I tried to keep up with him and I just couldn't do it. So he got a few steps in front of me and he looked over his shoulder and he real sarcastic. He says, you could do better than that. And when he said that, it's just like this incredible Hulk just... <laughs> man, I, get, I mean, my adrenaline kicked in and I passed that guy like he was in reverse. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but it's just real. You could do better than that. And bless God. I mean, something came up on the inside of me and I passed him and I collapsed at the finish line. <laughs> but there's just something inside of you that when somebody tells you, you can't do it, there's something that rises up and says, bless God, I will. So for those people who thought that, you know what, I've overcome my selfishness. I've quit. I don't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. I'm now a really, really good person and God's got to accept me and I've overcome my sin nature and 
I don't need God like some of these people who are drug addicts or alcoholics or prostitutes. I'm a really good person. God says, you think you're all right? Thou shalt not. And all of a sudden, sin rose up. It stre- the command strengthens sin. It will draw people to sin. This is counter what most people think. Most people think that the law keeps you from sinning. The law will cause you to lust. You know, if for some reason you didn't like chocolate, I don't know how you live if you don't like chocolate. (laughs) But let's just say that you don't even like chocolate. If I was to dangle a million dollars in front of you and say, I'm going to deposit a million dollars over here. And if you can go one year without chocolate, you can have this million dollars. Even if you didn't like chocolate, you would start being tempted for it just because you've been told that you couldn't have it and there's this goal. And if I was like God so that I could actually see your heart, not just your actions, but your heart, even if you'd never liked chocolate before, you'd go to wondering about, I wonder what chocolate tastes like. I guarantee you, if I gave you a prize and said, thou shalt not eat chocolate for one year, you would go to lusting for chocolate. It's just human nature and God knew this. And so for those who were already thinking that I'm such a good person, I'm not like other people. God's going to accept me just based on my own merit. God says, you think you're good? Thou shalt not. And he started giving all of these laws that made lust come alive in your heart. It made you actually lust. It says that over in Romans chapter seven, I'm trying to do this in sequence, but we'll get over there hopefully this morning. And it says that, that lust and concupiscence came through the law. When you go to pre, if you go to preaching, you shall not commit adultery. If you dare think about adultery, God's mad at you. God will not love you. God's going to judge you. God's going to get you. And if you preach against adultery every week, you will have a rash of adultery in your church. People can't understand that, but that's absolutely true. I had a preacher one time who was listening to me preach on this. And he was getting it. The Holy Spirit was bearing witness. And he he was in his study and he looked out and he had his young son in the backyard playing with a bunch of neighborhood kids. And he thought, I'm just going to go check this out. And so he called them all to the back door and he got them on the patio and he says, you kids are doing great. You're just playing good. Everything's been great. They'd been out there for an hour. And he says, you're doing just fine. But whatever you do, thou shalt not spit on this flower. And then he went back in the house and he looked out his window and he said, half of those kids walked right over and spit on that flower. And the other half stood there with their mouths drooling, just, you know, wishing that they were bold enough to spit on it. But they hadn't even noticed that that flower existed until somebody says, thou shalt not. And immediately they had a desire to do what they were commanded not to do. It's amazing how people miss this. They think preaching the law is going to keep people from living in sin. Let me ask you how that's working. (laughs) People will criticize me and say, you're giving people a license to sin. I say, they're doing pretty good without a license. Amen. (laughs) This legalism in law, has it made our people holy? And is it made them? I guarantee you, there are people that are out committing sin and even the ones that aren't doing it. I was one of those that was raised under condemnation. I never have done those things, but I guarantee you, I had lust in my heart. I felt so guilty. I would see profanity scribbled on a bathroom stall and I'd spend a week repenting because I read what somebody else wrote. (laughs) Some of you think, boy, you were messed up. That's what the law will do to you. I thought somehow or another I was defiled by just having the thought come through my brain, having the seeing somebody, what somebody else had scribbled. I can tell you, I didn't go out and do all of those things, but I was probably more condemned than many of you who went out and committed sexual acts, got drunk, smoked, lied, stole. I was more guilt ridden than most people who did those things because I was living under the law and just having a thought about it, even having a desire for it. I would be so condemned. The law strengthened sin. It didn't strengthen you. It strengthened sin. It's like sin had already beat you and you didn't know it. So God just gave something that made sin even stronger so that, man, you couldn't miss it. 
that sin had beat you and that you needed a Savior. That's the purpose of the law. It wasn't to set you free. It was to bind you. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and in verse 6 it says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, the New Covenant, not of the letter, that's the Old Covenant, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, the Old Testament law kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in...